Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our Lifestyle Medicine webinar. Today, we are going to focus on the importance of sleep. This is our final webinar in our 2023 series focused on let's get healthy in 2023. And I'm so excited to be joined by these amazing speakers today to focus on this important topic. Before we jump in, I'm going to introduce our speakers. Dr. Stephanie Eisenstadt is a practicing internist, certified coach, and physician educator in the Department of Medicine, Division of Internal Medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital. She is also an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, and she specializes in women's health, chronic disease management, and lifestyle medicine. Dr. Eisenstadt brings to our program over 30 years of experience as a practicing internist as a coach. Over the years, she has helped design and establish service programs to better support patients facing the challenges due to a range of chronic medical conditions. She is deeply committed to improving quality of life through lifestyle interventions, including nutrition, physical activity, stress reduction, and psychological well-being. She has joined our Mass General Cancer Center Lifestyle Medicine Paving the Path to Wellness team, as well as our Lifestyle Medicine group, in order to help patients along their cancer journey achieve their optimal level of wellness support and improved outcomes. Next, we are joined by Dr. Shalu Ramshandani. Dr. Ramshandani practiced primary care for 19 years before starting a private weight management practice at St. Elizabeth's Hospital. Being a clinician that is a catalyst for change, she also is trained as a health and wellness coach and culinary coach. She works part-time at the Benson Henry Institute for Mind-Body Medicine at Mass General Hospital, and she is also a part-time instructor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. In addition, she is on the faculty for the CHEF coaching program at the Institute of Lifestyle Medicine in Boston. Her main focus is using the evidence-based pillars from lifestyle medicine in a virtual group model in order to help individuals enforce sustainable behavioral change. Finally, we are so fortunate to be joined by breast cancer survivor and thriver, Heather Barto, who's gonna share her unique perspective and maybe a little bit about the role of chickens as part of cancer survivorship. On that note, I'm gonna turn the webinar off to our amazing team. Over to our amazing team. <laughs> All right, we're just going to bring up the slides here. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Commander, for that wonderful introduction. And I assume that if for some reason you can't hear me or the slides aren't working, that uh, somebody will alert alert me and we can take care of it, but hopefully everything uh, will go smoothly. So um, welcome everyone. Uh, in the first part of this webinar, I'm gonna cover some of the key points around the biology of sleep, the burden of not being able to sleep or what we call insomnia and strategies for getting a better night's sleep. Full disclosure, I'm not a sleep expert but we have experts who work with us in the cancer center who are and are open for referrals if you're really having trouble with sleep and you need additional help. So please, if this is the case for you, please reach out to us. Okay, so let's get started. So not sleeping well or insomnia is a solvable problem. That's number one. And there are many researchers actually worldwide who've been working on this. Colin Espy, based in the UK, is one of them, and he's mapped out the neurocircuits for sleep. And these are just a few of the more popular resources out there, including Richard Ferber. And many of us, when we were raising our kids, looked to Dr. Ferber, and many of you now may still look to Dr. Ferber for advice on how to get your kids to go to sleep. And uh, we called it Ferberizing our kids at the time. So the definition of insomnia. Well, insomnia is nocturnal unrest at least three times a week and over a period of more than three months. And sleep loss must not be linked to external factors such as a crying baby or partying too much. Also, insomnia is associated with impaired daytime functioning and you have symptoms from insomnia, fatigue, 
irritability, sometimes difficulty concentrating. So how much sleep do we actually need? Well, here's a graph comparing us humans to other animals and species. And we humans generally need seven to eight hours of sleep a night. And as we age, our sleeping patterns and needs actually can change. Often we get and perhaps do well enough with less sleep, five to six hours. There's also different patterns. I mean, cats, interestingly enough, uh, not only need the 16 hours of sleep, but they need multiple rounds of sleep. And who knew that uh, platypuses slept for almost 15 uh, hours a day? So what's actually happening in our brains? Here are some of the underlying brain areas that are driving insomnia or our inability to sleep. The neuro circuits are just not fully communicating and multiple areas of the brain are involved with a good night's sleep. The hippocampus, the amygdala, thalamus, the caudate head, the anterior cingulate cortex and the frontal cortex. And all of these parts of the brain need to work in concert. And researchers have found that some of our mental processes result in what they call a ruminative brain or a state of hyper arousal for some of these areas. And sleep, as you know, can be uh, disrupted for other factors too, pain and nausea. So let's turn now to the impact of insomnia and the impact of cancer on sleep. So we know from research that nearly 50% of people with cancer experience sleep disturbance. And in a study of over a thousand long-term cancer survivors over a nine year period post-diagnosis, uh, Stroller and Fallon found that sleep problems were often related to the fear of cancer recurrence and just the overall distress from the physical, emotional, and financial cancer-related uh, burden. Sleep disturbances were also associated with a lower quality of life and depression and difficulty with doing everyday activities and recovery. And when they asked this cohort of cancer survivors, they found sleep problems to be one of the more challenging uh, symptoms reported and that 40% of cancer survivors experienced some sleeping difficulty over a five-year period. So 20%, about 20% of the survivors reported that they didn't sleep well and had poor sleep quality. 51% said frequently they had trouble sleeping and high sleep disturbance. 17% said they had problems with both quality and disturbance and 28% said they had to take medication in order to help with sleep. And cancer survivors with untreated sleep problems may even be more strongly impacted by the physical distress, economic distress, and fear of recurrence that I mentioned. And their message was seek help for this. If you're having trouble with sleep, reach out to the medical care team if needed. The other thing researchers in the field have found is that people with cancer don't usually have just one symptom related to cancer treatment, but often there are several together in what's called cancer clusters. And one such cluster of symptoms can be sleep distur disturbances with cognitive difficulty and cognitive fogginess, depression and pain and fatigue, and all need to be addressed in order to get a better night's sleep. Another cluster is fatigue, nausea, and anorexia, or not feeling hungry, and then vomiting. And it's again, it's important that to take into account the whole person and the cluster of symptoms. There are some other conditions to note and think about that may drive insomnia for some people. One is sleep apnea, which is more common than you think. And with sleep apnea, the pattern of breathing is interrupted. Snoring can be an initial symptom, and sleep apnea is often associated with poor concentration, low mood, restless sleep, heartburn, waking up with a headache in the morning, night sweats, dizziness, weight gain, daytime fatigue, and lack of energy. So if you're finding that you have this constellation or pattern of symptoms, 
especially if you find you're snoring or somebody's telling you that you're snoring, talk to your medical team to see if you should be screened for sleep apnea. And another sim syndrome that we want you to keep in mind that can interrupt sleep is restless leg syndrome. And this is a feeling of achiness in the feet and the calves and the thighs at night, like something's crawling up your legs or an itching sensation under the skin. It happens at night and it happens at rest and it's relieved by actually moving the legs and sometimes medications are actually used. So again, if you have these types of symptoms that you've noticed, you know, discuss them with your uh, medical care team. So let's turn now to some strategies for a better night's sleep and what we know from the literature. So uh, here's where we're addressing some of the key pillars of lifestyle medicine can come in handy. Making sure you're eating well, plant-based diet, whole grains, et cetera. Getting exercise and physical activity and moving your body during the day. Avoiding risky substances, trying to reduce the stress, which includes practices like meditation and relaxation, and enhancing the social support. Naps during the day for some can actually be quite helpful, but we suggest that the nap be less than 20 to 30 minutes. Cornell psychologist James Moss found that in his research that 20 minute naps increased alertness and motor skills and less than 30 minutes avoided the deep sleep, which can cause you to feel very groggy during the day after a nap. Another trick is to stay on a set sleep schedule, plan a bedtime routine and go to sleep the same time every night. And preparing for sleep is important. We're now learning that blue light, for instance, boosts alertness, helps with memory and brain function, but then can interfere with sleep. But it may be waking up the brain when we want to quiet the brain. The blue light seems to fool the brain into thinking it's daytime, and then the melatonin levels in your brain go down, and melatonin relief helps us relax and prepare for sleep. And if you find you can't get sleep, experts recommend that you get out of bed for a short time, do something relaxing, like meditating, reading, or listening to music until you feel ready to return to sleep. And if you're having trouble, again, with crawling or staying asleep, contact your medical team and we, we can make a referral to our sleep specialist. Some other tips that might be helpful Incorporating relaxation techniques, even listening to music can really be helpful. There are neurologists who actually study music and the brain. And music improves sleep through calming parts of the autonomic nervous system, slowing down our breathing and heart rate and lowering our blood pressure. And music can also help with the uh, distracting and troubling thoughts that often uh, burden our mind. The National Sleep Foundation survey recommends that the bedroom temperature be around 65 degrees to increase, uh, to improve sleep based on their research. And research has also shown, interesting enough, that wearing a hat and socks to bed can help people fall asleep faster, but also sleep longer with less waking up during the night. It's, it's really interesting. The lower core body temperature is helpful for sleep. And when your feet are cold, your blood flow increases and your body temperature goes up so we can get that blood flow to the feet. And so interesting, in one study, hot flashes actually uh, decreased as well. And I want to make a short note about hot flashes and menopause. You know, this is, I know this is a very common problem for a lot of you who are on this webinar today. Uh, research is still underway to identify you know, what really is effective and works. Uh, strategies like hypnosis and cognitive behavioral therapy and even mindfulness training have been sh showing a lot of promise and help. There are medications that such as low dose citalopram and similar medications in this family that can be helpful uh, along the way. And so it's important to discuss this with your medical team and which one of these medications are right 
given uh, the medication protocol that you're that you're currently on. And uh, evidence has been sort of inconsistent on the efficacy of herbs and, and other supplements. Another thing to remember is that, you know, worry, uh, while it can uh, activate us into action and to purpose, but it can also inter interrupt sleep. And so setting aside some worrying time actually during the day and having a worry box can be helpful and practicing gratitude at night, calling out, actually saying what, you know, the blessings that you feel calms the mind down and helps with falling asleep. A couple of fast food tips. Uh, we all know that limit caffeine and remember that uh, chocolate is high in caffeine as well and avoid a heavy meal uh, in your bedtime. Tart cherry juice, uh, which contains melatonin, actually can help some people fall with falling asleep. And the same with kiwi and romaine lettuce and walnuts and some other uh, food groups. They seem to have ingredients that are thought to aid in relaxation and improving sleep. You know, make sure you get enough vitamin D. And then chamomile tea, lemon balm, passion fruit, and valerian root have been shown to be safe and can help uh, some people with sleep. So uh, treat your bedroom as an oasis. Try to keep your bedroom um, for sleep and intimacy. You know, aromatherapy is helpful for some people to aid in relaxation, particularly lavender and orange, lemon scents, a jasmine and rose scent, but fresh air works too. And uh, that side to side eye movement that you do when you're reading actually is also bringing relaxation at the same time. So I'll finish with on, on this portion of it and turn it over to Heather in a second. But remember, sleep resets our brain. And the whole point of sleep is to help reset that brain so we can achieve optimal capacity for learning, remembering, and for our health and the repair of our body. We'll have some, some time, hopefully, at the end of the session for questions. But now I'm going to uh, stop sharing on my end and over to Heather. Super. So can I, are my slides attached to your slides? No. Oh, I did not rec realize that. Um, are you able to bring up my slides? <laughs> Sorry for the poor, poor um, planning on my part. We, uh, I assumed that they were going to be attached. <laughs> um, like all one slide deck. Yes, hold on one second. Sorry for that. So while we're bringing up those slides, um, I just want to say a little bit about um, myself. So uh, when going through active cancer uh, treatment, um, I think it's a little bit about trial and error. And so trying some things that are, are working and some things that aren't working. And I really appreciated the perspective that Dr. Eisenstadt brought up um, regarding putting your room as an oasis. And I think that's really important. And during um, more active cancer treatment during radiation and chemotherapy, I started beginning to rearrange some things around in my room of like what brought some more calmness into um, my room. And some of those pieces that helped out were um, some of the slides that will bring up and um, bringing some, some calmness into my room. Um, uh, we're bringing some different colors to my room and some um, Himalayan salt lamp, um, which you'll, I'll talk a little bit about. So thinking about what's in your room and um, what's out of your room. So bringing some um, clutter that was in my room, I removed some of those things that were a little bit bothersome to me. Um, when I spent a little more time in bed than when I had intended um, upon. So that had stressed me out a little bit at the time. So removing some of those pieces um, was a little more helpful. I'm, I'm working on it on my little Mac. Sure. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether Dr. Co uh, Commander can get them up uh, quicker. Sure. Uh, sorry about that. Um, I assume that they're all going to be on one slide deck. Um, yeah, no problem. And maybe we, the three of us can uh, work on it all together here quickly. Um, I have uh, five slides that I had um, on there. And so I think a little bit of it is trial and error. And so some of the things that I think are important is um, conversing with family and friends and, and finding out some of their sleep habits. I think what Di Dr. Eisenstadt speaks to the, the science and the evidence-based components that are available. And I think Certainly, those are the pieces to try right up front, and I tried many of those things as well, too, and I did experience a significant amount of insomnia, um, and so some of those pieces did work, and then I supplemented it with a few things. 
um, that we'll talk about in um, a minute here. And some of those pieces were around acupuncture. And so acupuncture was a big part of um, success for my treatment at Mass General that was available during the integrative therapies um, component that I used during chemotherapy as well as during radiation. I found that to be extremely helpful. It was the first time I had um, experienced um, using acupuncture. So that was very helpful during my treatment and reduced a lot of my symptoms and side effects and then helped me on the back end of it of uh, sleeping better, much better at night. So um, I sought out community um, acupuncture in my town and um, in our slide deck, when we put that up and make it available on the website, it will also link to, you can find a local acupuncture um, in your town or your city so that you can go find that as a community um, resource for yourself. So I think that's an alternative practice that you can consider for um, rounding out your practices for sleep that helped me um, during my cancer treatments. And then afterwards um, uh, brought about many beneficial um, better night's sleep, as well as reducing some side effects from cancer treatments. Um, some of the other things that I found that were helpful for me was using some um, salt, salt lamps and halo therapy. So I uh, purchased the Himalayan salt lamp that I placed um, beside my bed. Um, and I also went to some salt caves. And so a uh, salt cave I visited in Vermont when I was visiting family, as well as uh, one local in New Hampshire. And um, again, the slide deck will represent the resources and information on there, but you can search for salt caves in your area. And it's a opportunity to go get um, medical grade, pharmaceutical grade um, salts that are distributed in particles in the air. And you're sitting in a in a very relaxing environment where you're sitting in a salt cave and um, just slow breathing in an environment that it can promote um, deeper sleeping and um, can round out some other um, inflammatory components and um, lung um, challenges and asthma and other um, breathing challenges as well too that um, has beneficial properties in it. So the salt lamp for me was a thing to bring calmness to my room um, and it has a dimmable uh, switch on it. So it's not something that's bright again before you go to bed, but rather bringing it down to a calming space before you go to sleep. So bringing those pieces in. Uh, another thing that I found really helpful was essential oils. So I um, brought was, was new to me. Some friends actually gave me some doTERRA or doTERRA essential oils when I was going through chemotherapy. And one of the ways that I used that was to help reset my mind during the day um, to be able to help reset of like, gosh, I'm really feeling nauseous or not feeling well, but that helped on the other end of the day um, for, for sleep time as well too, and be able to use that with a diffuser. So you can buy a simple diffuser off of Amazon and being able to use that with a few drops. And then I also ended up using that um, as well in a small uh, three ounce size um, just this three ounce size travel size uh, water bottle with some water in it and three or four drops of as a room spray. And I also sprayed it on my pillow with a lavender, a very calming scent to it. So I would try um, pieces like that, that just again, provided a very calming um, scent. It wasn't an overpowering scent and that just promoted like a very calming space for me um, as I'm preparing to sleep. And um, my kids would often say, is it time to spray our pillows? <laughs> So we kind of got the whole family um, involved that we're trying to bring noises down, volumes down. It's trying to just bring your, your spaces down to a calming place to go, go um, time for sleep. But it also just um, uh, provided a place to be able to relaxation and um, kind of reprogram my brain of like reprogram my brain to say, okay, the lavender scent is now associated with time for relaxation and sleep. So that helped me kind of reprogram my brain a little bit. So the diffuser, as well as um, you can get essential oils that um, are roll-on style that you can roll on your wrist, or I would put a little bit behind my ears. Um, certainly you can do your research online um, with Amazon or, or local ones or local health food stores, et cetera, um, for the best uh, calming sense for you. Um, and I'm trying to think anything else that I had for my slides. So Heather, you are doing a fantastic job. Unfortunately, my my, no problem. my little old computer here is yeah because it won't it won't bring up to be able to access. Sure, me. no problem. Yeah, but so I think, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, these are great tips, and it's really wonderful to hear your perspective and how you've been so creative to explore various strategies to help improve your sleep and integrating all these various types of 
things you've mentioned that we as doctors don't necessarily recommend for our patients because maybe these are things that we haven't tried or don't know as much about. So I love that you're sharing your perspective on what's worked so well for you. So that's amazing. And well, how, did you want to say something, Heather? Yeah, I was just going to say the um, thing that I really tried to think when I put my information together was around cost. So some things cost very little for free up, up to um, a little bit more of a expensive for um, private, more for acupuncture. So just thinking about cost and what works for you. So thinking about that when you're setting for your um, supporting for your sleep routine and um, putting that into perspective. And it's a little bit of trial and error along with the effective um, evidence-based um, information that you receive from Dr. Eisenstadt. So I'm gonna pass it over to Shalou. Thank you. Heather, were you gonna talk about the chickens too? Oh. <laughs> yeah, why don't you tell us a little bit about yeah. them? Yeah, no problem. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'll just do a quick story. I think uh, most people really enjoy hearing about um, Chicken. So when I finished my um, uh, radiation, it was sort of, I was looking for something to sort of um, <laughs> celebrate and um, look for a new hobby for something that I had um, never uh, experienced before, something that I could take care of that had nothing to do with cancer, nothing to do with breast cancer, nothing to do with chemotherapy, and was sort of done talking about it, knowing that I still had more treatments, more things to figure out, more things to navigate, was in the signed up for the paving group and all of those pieces. So there was not like it went away, but I just was sort of sick of talking about all of it. So I went from never touching a chicken into my entire life to um, getting a couple of chickens. And my friend, Angie, um, got me a couple of chickens and she brought them over. And I was, um, my daughter and I built a chicken coop. We ordered it off Amazon. We built it from scratch and she brought the chickens over. And I said, um, well, well, can you, can you put them in the coop? And she's like, well, aren't you going to pick them up? And I was, I was, I'm not ready to pick them up. <laughs> she said, you do realize you're going to have to touch them, right? And I said, tomorrow's good. <laughs> so that was um, <laughs> two years, two and a half years ago. And so um, from then until now, I have what now I refer to as the HB chicken hut. And they have a condo now that's a eight foot by 16 uh -huh. foot um, hut. And then they have a new upgraded coop and I've had so much fun with it. I have a TikTok account and I'm now up to eight chickens. Don't tell my city, but I'm up to eight chickens and I give my eggs away to my neighbors and I have a lot of fun with them. I've trained them. So when I let them out in free range, I can yell out, hey girls, and they come running back <laughs> in to me and I have a uh, swing in there for them. And I have these gymnastic Aww. type things that they can go into and um, installed a uh, automatic door opener for them in their coop for in the morning at night. And really it has been not about the chickens, but about caring for something else outside of myself and learning so much about them that I've rescued a couple from um, my sister that didn't wanna take care of them anymore and um, loves telling the story about them and can tell you a lot about chickens. And um, they really saved me because it gave me a whole new skill to learn about. And then uh, when I had had some physical side effects from recovering from radiation, from some cording, it actually was helping me for um, doing some physical therapy exercises. Um, so there's a multiple benefits for caring for chickens. So um, I have a lot of fun about them and I've um, spoken about them in a lot of ways and have um, shared a lot of videos with um, learning about them, winterizing them. They all made it through the winter and um, have a lot of fun with them. So yeah, that's kind of my chicken story in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that, Heather. Um, on this, you know, on the same note, I guess um, I should say, I, I'm part of my work, um, as Amy had mentioned, that I'm at the Herbert Benson Mind Body Medicine Institute at MGH. And we often will see a lot of patients who suffer from insomnia, just having a lot of difficulty staying asleep or falling asleep. And one of the things that Heather just reminded me of is that the, the role of positive emotions is so strong with just being able to fall asleep. And this really put a big smile on my face listening to your story. And I was just thinking about what I'm gonna be thinking about tonight when I get into bed, because already I can feel those positive emotions and all those happy hormones being lifted. Um, we often focus so much on negative things that are happening in our day, right? We, we worry about, oh, how we got that ticket and you know today driving, or we just sit, we tend to think about things that didn't go so well. So on the note, when uh, Dr. Eisenstadt was talking about um, gratitude, you know, doing the gratitude journaling at night, it is true that we we don't 
take the time to really count all the blessings that we've had in our day um, and the positive things that have happened to us. So along the same lines, what I have found is that people who have suffered from insomnia for uh, many years um, tend to focus a lot on what if I don't fall asleep tonight, right? So we all tend to go to those places where if I don't fall asleep right now, I'm not going to be rested tomorrow to be able to drive to that game or whatever it is that we have to do the next day. So on the same note of just having those positive thoughts is so helpful to decrease that stress response. So along with the gratitude and thinking about the, all the amazing things that have happened in your day, really just focusing on positive um, perspectives on when you are trying to get to sleep, which could be something like, I want to, um, I'm going to engage in this meditation practice because, hey, it has worked for many others and it will likely work for me too, because that's building those positive perspectives instead of focusing on the negative things that we tend to do like, oh, here we go again. I'm not going to fall asleep again. Um, so I just wanted to put a, a little thing for that because it's so important to just remain positive throughout our day. Um, and I'm gonna share only a couple of slides because of course we've had so many beautiful slides um, from Stephanie that I don't need to talk too much about this. Um, let me see if, if you can see my slides here, right? I imagine, okay, great. So the first one is really just about um, our metabolic health and the pillars of metabolic health. And as, um, a med as a, an obesity medicine specialist, I do see a lot of patients who suffer from having metabolic health consequences as a result of not having sufficient sleep. So, you know, this slide just was really just to stress the importance of the sleep and how important it is just for our metabolic health, along with, of course, our mood and our, you know, uh, relationships energy and everything else that we already have heard about. And she already covered some amazing tips. Um, so I don't have to go through this entire list, but I just wanted to point out that yes, blue light does affect our melatonin levels and it will drop our melatonin levels at night. And if you are somebody who wants to watch something, you know, a, a show or news, and you are going to be get exposed to blue light. Getting Amber Lens over um, Amazon or wherever some of these uh, brands have been very helpful for a lot of our patients. Um, so if you wear glasses, you can get the clip-ons to have Amber Lens, and that will help with uh, light filtering as well. And then the only um, other Dr. Ramson, Dad, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Do you want to put it in presentation mode? I don't know. You know, on the PowerPoint on the bottom right. Um, oh, so sorry. Slides, um, but um, hang on, wait one second. Are yeah. you? Oh, I didn't do yeah. that. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's okay. We see them. But... Here we go. It's going to be here somewhere. Play from. Hey, there you go. There we go. Okay, perfect. Is that better? Um, it's yeah. fine. We're good. It's fine. Is that good? Okay. Slide. Here we go. Uh, oh, you know what I can do? Yeah, I see what you're saying. Hang on one second. So let me go back out and then I will do- The thing about the lifestyle medicine team is we go with the flow. So we just go with the flow. Wanna, yeah. <laughs> so there's actually go with the third. There this we go. Perfect. Yes. We got this. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so that you can see that a whole lot better now. Okay, great. So so that's the brand up there, the Swan Wick and the Elements Active for the clip-on. Um, and then the time-restricted eating, um, we she, Stephanie already did touch on that earlier, is about really focusing on having at least uh, four hours, you know, of a fast before you get to sleep. And the other thing that I wanted to point out I, for people who do use melatonin, not all brands are trustworthy out there for what you're getting. Um, so I wanted to just really put a plug out for some of the brands that I know that um, some of my, our patients have benefited from like Whole Foods has a nice, um, the Whole Foods brand, the 365, Trader Joe's makes a good product as well. And I'm sure there's others that are equally good. Um, so I just wanted to um, make sure that you knew that and you can't trust all the brands that are available. And, um, and then in terms of 
doing a practice. I don't think there's anything easy about doing a relaxation practice, especially when we want to relax now and right away. And we have tons of thoughts going through our head all the time. Um, so what I thought we could do for a few minutes is practice Ujjayi breathing. And some of you may be familiar with Ujjayi breath because of yoga. So a lot of times in yoga, practices, you'll hear people say using your ujjayi breathing, you'll be moving from one asana, one pose to another. Now you can use ujjayi breathing and you're, you know, just sitting. I sometimes will use it while I'm driving before I start my day for work. And essentially what this is helpful for is helping you to slow down your breath. Oftentimes we are, um, we're doing very shallow breaths when we're under a stress response. And most of the times we don't even realize when we're under a, you know, a stress response because our day may have been such, but there's not an acute stress, but it's all the little chronic stresses that build up in our day that makes us have a lot of sort of mindless just thinking which is what we are always doing, right? We're thinking a lot um, and thinking about worrying about the future or thinking about the past. So when you're in a stress mode, that often will make your breaths very shallow and it doesn't feel like we're constantly in a, in a tightness sort of mode because the stress hormones tighten our muscles a lot. So we're constantly feeling that tension in our neck and our chest and our back. So when you're doing a relaxation technique, what we're focusing on is really slowing down our breath. So if you're breathing at about 12 to 13 breaths per minute, which is what we all do, in Ujjayi breathing, in, in a slow breath, you want to try to bring that down even as slow as like eight to 10. So the definition of Ujjayi, as you can see, it's, um, it's really using your breath control and to help you breathe slower and using your throat as a tightening. So when we talk about tightening of the throat, it's kind of like an ocean breath. Um, so when you want to fog, like say a mirror or your glasses, it's that sound that you make when you do that, it goes. So it's that tightening of the throat. So now I want to have all of you actually try just doing that sound, but without opening your mouth. So maybe you'll do it once or twice with, with your mouth open, just so you get that feeling of that tightening. So let's just do that together. Great. So you felt that a little bit of tightening, little constriction there and that ocean sound. Now I'm gonna ask you to practice that with your mouth closed. So we're really just using our nose to breathe. Okay, so that would be the next thing that we practice. So let's do that for a couple of breaths together. I hope, I can't see everyone here, but I hope that was something that you were able to reproduce with your mouth closed. Stephanie, Heather, yeah. Okay, all right, great. Um, so what we're gonna do now is using a metronome and this, the only reason to do this, and you don't have to do this at night in bed with a metronome um, because that sound could be a little bit bothersome. What I want people to start getting used to is the cadence. And the cadence of your breath is you wanna to try to inhale to a count of four beats, and then you'll exhale to a count of four beats using your ujjayi breath. And the purpose of this really is to, is to activate the opposite of your stress response. So the stress response is our sympathetic nervous system. And what we're doing here is activating the parasympathetic nervous system. So your blood pressure will come down, your pulse will come down and your muscles will relax. And this, what's nice about doing this breathing practice is your attention is focused on your breath, which also helps to stop the, the train of everyday thoughts that we keep having, right? Um, so let's try this together. Um, and I'm gonna play this metronome and have you 
focus on just inhaling slowly through your nose to a count of four. And then with the ocean breath, exhaling with your mouth closed through your nose to four. And then we'll do this practice for, let's do like a minute. I think we have time for that. So, okay, here we go. I think that was like about 30 to 40 seconds, but I hope you all got a flavor for what how your breath can really slow down with that sort of cadence. Um, and it, it generally we recommend there has to be an equal of the inhalation and exhalation. And you may have a different capacity. So maybe you're inhaling to a count of three because that's all you can handle right now and then you'll exhale to a count of three. So we all have that different capacity of what we can do. And for some, it might be five that you're inhaling to and then exhaling to five. Um, and that would be the first sort of step as to where you can start your relaxation practice. So I recommend everyone have a place where they can sit comfortably with your um, spine straight and do this daily practice, but maybe before you go to bed. So it's like winding down before you sleep at night. And you don't have to have the metronome because over time, you know what that cadence is for you. And you're able to, you know, do this, you know, in your mind on your own without the metronome. Metronome is helpful for a lot of people. And I also find that it's a little easier when you're doing a practice um, listening to the metronome because your mind's not wandering as much. Now, keep in mind, it's very normal for the mind to wander. There's no reason why it needs to turn off because we're telling it to turn off, right? So just don't feel bad about that. Don't be, you know, feel you know, harsh on yourself about it because that's just very normal that it will wander away because you're going to remember something that you didn't get to do today and that you were supposed to. And that's okay. And as when you remember this, whatever it is, just say, oh, that's okay. I'm just thinking again. And I'm just going to bring my attention right back to my practice. And sometimes we're mind wandering and bringing it back, bringing it back 10 times, 12 times, it doesn't matter. It does get easier, but, but staying with it is the most important. And then the only other tip that I will share is that oftentimes people wake up in the middle of the night before you reach, sorry, for your phone and look at the time and you know, all the things that we do that stress us even more, which is, oh my gosh, it's already 4 a.m. Oh my gosh. Like, and then we go into this cycle. So instead, I'm going to ask that you just stay in bed. Don't look at your phone. And I love this meditation by uh, Thich Nhat Hanh. It's called Just This. And what I love about this meditation is it's kind of like counting sheep, except it's better because there is this element of acceptance. This is just what it is. And with this particular meditation, you are, when you inhale, you're inhaling to the word just in your mind, and then you exhale to 10 on the, on the out breath, and then you inhale 
and repeat the word just in your mind. And then you out breath, you say nine. And then you stay with this pattern of just eight, just seven, just six, until you come down to just one. And then when you're at just one, then you inhale with saying this on the in-breath and then exhale with 10. And then this, nine, this, eight, and then you are, again, all the inhalations and exhalations are only through your nose. And then when you come down to this one, then on the in-breath, you're repeating just exhaling to this, just this. And then you stay with this meditation and hopefully you'll fall asleep, right back asleep before you have the chance to do anything else. Um, so, I um, I have found this to be very helpful for me, and I hope um, it will be for you guys too. Um, good, that's all I have. That was great. Thank you so much. Such really useful information from all of you. So certainly I want our viewers to know that they can um, put a question in the Q&A box and we will look out for it. And um, Dr. Ramchandani, I've actually used that meditation that you just told us about. So I'm so glad that you shared it. And I've also found it to be really helpful um, in those times when you wake up and you really just can't fall back to sleep. But yeah. I do want to follow up on, um, because we've learned a lot from our sleep colleagues through lifestyle medicine and through the paving program, et cetera. Um, so let's say you try that meditation and you really can't fall asleep. And just following up on what Dr. Eisenstadt had talked about, like what are some other suggestions if you're like lying there, now you're looking at the clock, can't fall back to sleep. What is it recommended that we try to do to help with our sleep? I just said, Dr. I said, did you want to take that one? So I, well, I think I, I love the meditation and I think the whole, there's different ways to calm the brain. And mm -hmm. I think we always get so intimidated by, you know, the thoughts come in and mm -hmm. you know, we're sweating in the middle of the night. And then we realize all the things we have to do the next day. And, oh my God, if I don't go back to sleep. And so I, I really like the idea of calming the brain, um, in the way that that you've described i mean music helps mm -hmm. reading i found uh when i was reviewing for this uh webinar just the fact that the eyes kind of going gently back and forth is a meditative process in and of itself so often reading and they suggest reading calm books not you know, yes. not, not romance novels that have all this <laughs> lurid stuff, in it or, you know, or uh, science fiction that's going to, you know, take you on to another journey, but it's something calming that uh, can, can sometimes be helpful. So the other two suggestions I have, um, one, one is I definitely agree with the reading and I have also heard, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but not to stay in bed then to read, but actually going into a different room um, because the tossing and turning by staying in bed for more than 20 minutes can really play with your mind then, and that stresses us out even more. So maybe going into your living room and reading on your couch until you're feeling tired again or sleepy, and then you go back into your bedroom. Um, and then the other um, thing that I had come across that I personally have not used, I'm gonna be honest, um, but uh, it's called binaural beats sounds. Mm -hmm. And those, um, the binaural beats, I'm gonna see if I can maybe even play it on YouTube, have been shown to be very helpful for people to fall back asleep. And it's really about um, activating the certain type of waves in your brain. So it's the theta and the, the delta waves that are, associated with people getting sleepy and being in deep sleep. And, and that's what the music um, helps to sort of trigger for us. Um, and I, I can't really find it right now. Hang on one second, let me see if I can find it. Um, yeah, okay, here we go, I found it. All right, so, sorry? Oh, it was like, yeah, looking forward to learning. Okay, so I'm just gonna just play it from YouTube and share that. So this one, again, I don't know this particular website, but I'm going to, oh, it's uh -oh. not, yeah, bummer. <laughs> All right, never mind. Um, but 
maybe if I if we can't can play it right now, you can just look it up. Okay, here's one. Hey, it's Floyd Money Mayweather. Let me Do you skip need health that. Insurance? Sorry, over here, there's twenty nine dollars per month health insurance hat. So this is the they're called binaural beat sounds, and I know that Spotify has them as well. Like, so if you have Spotify or um, or just on your phone, um, skip trial. Sorry. So it doesn't sound like much, but can you hear it? Can you hear it? You can't hear it? Oh, you can't hear it. Okay, never mind. Okay, um, I'll stop sharing then. <laughs> um, that's funny because I can hear it really loud, but okay. <laughs> Anyhow, you can look it up. It's B I N A U R A L, binaural Great. beats. We, thank you. We do have one question coming in. Is reading from a Kindle good or bad before trying to go to sleep? That's a great question because a Kindle is a screen and we mm -hmm. know so many of our viewers, including ourselves, are now turning to Kindles instead of books. My kids are like, mom, stop buying books. You should just use your Kindle. So I'm curious what your thoughts are about that. Dr. Eisenstadt, do you want to take a first stab at that? Well, so I was wondering, because it's a different kind of screen mm -hmm. than yeah. the iPads, and it's really the blue light, um, and, and and the uh, Kindle is more gray. I don't, um, Dr. Uh, Barb, do you think, do you have anything to add about that or any experience with that, or Heather? I, I think, I, I think it does have a different, I don't think it's blue light Kindle, as, as oh, my understanding as well. One. Yeah. And I know also on your phone, you can adjust the settings so you can be, yeah, in, in the sort of the dark mode. So you're not getting that blue light exposure. So, so I think Kindle has a similar sort of setup. That's my understanding. As you can tell, we're not a bunch of Kindle fanatics here. No. Maybe you are, Heather. I don't <laughs> know. Like I do have books. one, but I like my books. So, um, Heather, I'm curious, you shared so many interesting strategies that you explored to help with your sleep. Prior to your breast cancer diagnosis, did you sleep fine or were you already incorporating some of these interesting techniques into your routine? Um, I, I've always been a very light sleeper, but I definitely did not have insomnia. Um, so I think one of the things I was able to do previously was just try to tire myself out, maybe more exercise. But when I wasn't able to do as much as I was previously, or I tired out a lot more, that was, I felt like um, I needed to find other strategies. And I also needed to find more strategies because I was, um, had my breast cancer during the pandemic in the earlier part of the pandemic where no one was allowed to be with you or around you at any point in time. Mm -hmm. So um, I needed to find things that also for financially that I could afford. So that's why I kind of reached out to what was available. So even things like ASMR on TikTok, I listened to a lot of that, you know, the tapping of sounds and things like that to just try to help. That helped a lot for me. So they're not necessarily evidence-based, but they were things that help settle me down at night and um, distract me. And so, um, and then friends dropped off gift baskets of things. So that's how I got introduced to the essential oils and the salt cave. Someone gave me a gift certificate for that. So when I was able to go to that, so I got introduced to them through networking and friends. And um, some of them ended up being fantastic. The acupuncture was through Mass General. And that ended up being a game saver in a lot of ways. And then that helped tremendous with um, sleeping. Um, so I just try to pass on the good things that, that I learned. Love that. That's great. Highlighting social connection. That's another yeah. lifestyle yes. medicine, all the wonderful support you've received. And that I know you continue to give back to others. That's, that's great. That's great. Wow. So what about, there was a question submitted to us um, about, Again, this is a tough one too, but you know, hot flashes and Heather, maybe you have a personal experience with this. I don't know if you want to speak to it, but that's certainly a number of our patients with breast cancer do experience that at night. And that can be very disruptive for sleep. And I know we've commented on some strategies, but Heather, so, what's your um, one of the first things I did was get the lightest um, nighttime attire I could. So anything cotton and like light. So that was one of the first thing that I did was try to shop for the lightest attire I could at night um, just for that and then um my poor husband like the AC went up 
as high as it could in the summertime, maybe a little bit into the fall too. <laughs> and um, uh, what was, the, oh, the, a cooling pillow. So having a cooling memory foam pillow near my head, like for the back of my neck, that helped a lot. And then just using a sheet instead of a blanket. So a couple of things like that. And then just staying hydrated a lot during the day. Um, so those three things helped um, with me. And then really being very connected with my doctor. And I'm very good at, um, like, I'll be your best patient because I'll give you every report and very good at data reporting. Um, maybe too much, but I'm very precise with my reporting of when things happen so that I can bring the best information forward. So that was best for my care. And um, I'd rather be over-reporting of symptoms and be exact with them so that better care decisions can be made than under-reporting them or being dismissive of them. So the more precise you are, not necessarily telling the whole story about it, but being very precise with your symptoms of reporting, and then that will help for a better care plan with your physician. I found that to be super helpful with my care planning um, and just being sure to make sure I'm timely reporting of my symptoms or side effects of medication so better um, decisions can be made about my care. I couldn't agree more. Wonderful advice. Sure. Yeah, those are really great comments, and I'm sure our viewers ap appreciate that. So thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Well, we and have three more minutes. So do you all want to share? Sorry, Dr. Eisenstadt, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, I was just going to say, you know, it, it's it's really hard to have the, the symptoms, the hot flashes, and yes. the, the, the change. Your, your whole body is changing. And I love, Heather, how you you talk about, you know, you need to journal what's happening inside. Mm -hmm. What are you actually experiencing and feeling? And then share that with the medical team to try to problem solve together. A lot of times, you know, there aren't, we, we don't have as clear answers to all of this, but we want to help. And that you know, meeting of the minds and really working off the symptoms, we can, we can look into our toolbox and see if there are things that can actually be individualized and, and help you feel better. So thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. And that you're not alone, I think, is the message, is that sharing that and you have um, building your social network around you. And I think that's really important. And the paving program does a great job with that at Mass General. So you have um, friends and colleagues that you'll meet and can give back um, and webinars and things like this, but also that you're not alone. And so whether it's you're doing that through your social network networks and friends, but meeting other um, breast cancer survivors, and that's how you can, um, you know, have that connection, but also with your medical team, you, you everything that you're experiencing is real and you should be sharing it with your care team. Right. And be kind to yourself. Right. Right. Be kind. These are some great concluding remarks. So really appreciate your insights. And Dr. Ramshandani, I don't know if you had a final closing suggestion about sleep that you wanted to share. Um, no, I was just going to, I was on the note of being kind. I think self-compassion is such an important part of all of this, right? And, um, you know, really focusing on just love, love for yourself, love for your family, your friends, um, and, you know, focusing on those positive thoughts when you're ending your day and, and being thankful, you know. Love that. Thank you. Um, on that note, I'm so grateful to all of you for speaking at this webinar today. I know our viewers are as well. And just mentioning that if you are watching this webinar and really want to work on strategies to improve your sleep, our lifestyle medicine clinic is here for you. Certainly, as Heather noted, the paving program is a great resource for individuals with breast cancer. Also, our psychology colleagues certainly have the ability to see patients um, with sleep disturbance, such as Dr. Daniel Hall, one of our wonderful colleagues who's doing innovative research in this area. So there are lots of ways that we want to help um, cancer survivors improve sleep habits at the MDH Cancer Center. So um, please reach out if there's other ways we can help you. Thank you all for attending today. Thank you. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.